Welcome back investors to Ticker Time News. I'm Adam and here's your update on the Workhorse v. United States USPS case as of July 27th. And let me tell you, this is more than just a motion by the United States to get more time because it was revealed what caught the United States off guard to request more time to begin with. And we're going to get into all of that. But real quick, before we get started, smash that like button, share this video, and click subscribe to join our family of investors. Now, let's get into it. On July 20th, and this is the blue highlighted area you see on the screen, Workhorse filed a sealed response to the motion to dismiss on time and as scheduled. Since this motion was sealed, we do not have the actual document to go through to see their strategy for establishing their complaint. Now, on July 26th, which is the green highlighted area, we got an unopposed motion for extension of time filed by the United States. Since this motion is unopposed, this means that Workhorse agrees to this extension of time. The original due date would have been July 27th, but this extension gives the United States an additional seven days until August 3rd to respond to Workhorse's response. Yes, I know there are a lot of responding to responses, but that's how we get to the end goal result. Now, the time extensions are very common in the legal system. However, this motion gives us a glimpse into Workhorse's strategy. When we look at the motion, it starts off by stating what we've already mentioned. Then it reveals a little information about Workhorse's strategy that we did not know about before now. And I must say, this is a brilliant argument on the part of Workhorse and their lawyers. And here's the part that's so telling. It's highlighted in yellow. In addition to responding to the arguments about exhaustion, and we've covered the exhaustion argument extensively in another video. I'll share that link in the description. You can watch it if you have time. However, plaintiff also argues that the administrative process established by the United States Postal Service violates the Constitution's appointment clause. That is a critical line to remember. Violates the Constitution's appointments clause. It continues, this is a complex and nuanced issue that requires further research, consideration, as well as consulting with Postal Service attorneys. To adequately respond to plaintiff's appointment clause argument, additional time is necessary. And boy, oh boy, do they need that additional time to respond. Because there was a Supreme Court ruling just this past June that is going to shed a lot of light on what this violation of the Constitution appointment clause is. So... Now, a question that you may be asking is, what is this appointments clause? Well, a quick search of the Constitution, and we get to Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2, and I've highlighted the important parts and I've taken the legal parts out. But in essence, the president shall nominate with the advice and consent of the Senate, which is the confirmation hearing, appoint all officers of the United States. But the Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior officers. We have officials and inferior officers. What are inferior officers? Well, the next place that we go, this was a court case, Edmund v. United States, and it breaks down in this short paragraph what is an inferior officer. 
So just real quick, hang with me here. We're going to get to, we're going to get to understanding how this all comes together. In Edmund v. United States, the court reviewed the definition of inferior officer and disregarding some implications of its prior decisions seemingly settled unanimously on a pragmatic characterization. Thus, the importance of the responsibilities assigned an officer, the fact that duties were limited, that jurisdiction was narrow, and that tenure was limited only are only, excuse me, are only factors but are not definitive. Generally speaking, the term inferior officer connotes a relationship with some higher ranking officer or officers below the president. That's going to be important for understanding inferior officer. It continues. Whether one is an inferior officer depends on whether he has a superior. It is not enough that other officers may be identified whom formerly maintained a higher rank or possesses responsibilities of a greater magnitude. If that were the intention the Constitution might have used the phrase lesser official rather in the context of a clause designed to preserve political accountability relative to important government assignments. We think it evident that inferior officer are officers whose work is directed and supervised at some level by others who are appointed by presidential nomination with the advice and consent of the Senate. Very important to understand the, the difference here, okay? So we just read through the case Edmund v. United States. Now, we know who an inferior officer is. An inferior officer in a company structure is if you have a supervisor over you, the supervisor would be superior while the employee would be inferior. That's, that's the basic difference. Okay. Now we need to figure out how it relates to the USPS and who or what falls under a higher ranking officer or officers below the president within the USPS that we could also relate back to the appointments clause. What is a group of people in the USPS that could be considered officials? The Board of Governors of the United States Postal Service. The board oversees the activities of the Postal Service with the Postmaster General actively manages its day-to-day -day operations. Now, the board controls expenditures of the USPS and reviews its practices and policies. There is one important job the board handles, and that's the election of the Postmaster General. President Joe Biden likely wants to fire Postmaster DeJoy and appoint a new Postmaster General. The problem under current law Biden does not have the power to either fire the existing postmaster general or to appoint a new one. Now, does this mean Biden will be stuck with DeJoy for as long as he wants to remain postmaster general? Not necessarily. DeJoy's appointment may be in violation of the appointments clause in article two of the constitution. Now, I'm starting to see what Workhorse could be arguing here. This is Workhorse's original complaint. If we just type in president, that shows up five different times in their complaint. And here's what it's zeroing in on. The first one is um, section 68. This award came shortly after President Biden's executive order on January 27, 2021, 
directing the procurement of clean and zero emission vehicles for federal, state, local, and tribal government fleets, including vehicles of the USPS. That executive order is important to Workhorse's case because what they're going to try to argue is that the president supersedes what the USPS says by this executive order and by the appointments clause. Now, if we go through here, where's the president mentioned? Aha, section 72. On March 1, 2021, Senator Brown, Representative Ryan, and others wrote a letter to President Biden expressing concern over Postmaster General DeJoy's February 23rd remarks and the USPS's decision to award an initial contract to provide up to 165,000 new postal vehicles over the next decade without any commitment to making these vehicles either hybrid or 100% electric. The letter also requested that the contract be delayed until a thorough review is conducted. Now, another place president is mentioned is in the public interest, the ending of Workhorse's original complaint. It's in 179, 180, 181, and it just says, finally, the public interest favors the granting of injunctive relief. Second, and as demonstrated by President Biden's recent executive order, congressional discourse and other public attention, retail investors, the public interest in the USPS's vast fleet, environmental sustainability, and fiscal responsibility favors the granting of injunctive relief, 182. Under these circumstances, it is incumbent upon the court to issue a permanent injunction to protect the public's interest and to safeguard the integrity of the procurement process. So this is all in Workhorse's original complaint. So you can see there, there are many times that President Biden's executive order is mentioned. We need to understand some context to get what I believe Workhorse could be arguing. The president used to appoint the Postmaster General as one of his cabinet members. In 1970, however, Congress enacted the Postal Reorganization Act, transferring the U.S. Postal Department into the U.S. Postal Service as an independent agency to be run like a corporation. As part of the reorganization, Congress altered the USPS's leadership structure instead of the Postmaster General serving as the head, Congress placed the Board of Governors, which consists of up to 11 members in charge, nine members appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate, while the other two members are the Postmaster General himself and the Deputy Postmaster General. Can you see where this is heading with the appointment clause and why it's unconstitutional? If not, you will in just a moment. I promise you that. Now, remember at the beginning, the United States USPS wanted more time to review the appointments clause. That's because there was a recent case the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in a 5-4 decision. This Supreme Court ruling upheld that administrative patent judges possesses too much unreviewable authority for officers who have not been appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Now, what position in the USPS possesses too much unreviewable authority who has not been appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate, the Postmaster General. 
And this is why I believe Workhorse is stating the administrative process established by the USPS violates the Constitution's Appointments Clause. See, only the Board of Directors has the authority to appoint and fire the Postmaster General. Effectively, the President has no say in who the Postmaster General is, except indirectly through the selection of board members. Once appointed by the board member, the Postmaster General also becomes a voting member of the board which is a key constitutional point that Workhorse is possibly ch claiming or challenging. This is where the Appointments Clause, which lays out the process for appointing federal officials and judges, comes in. It categorizes federal government officials as either superior or inferior. If the officer is a superior officer, only the president can make the appointment, which must be confirmed by the Senate. If the officer is an inferior officer, Congress may authorize judges or department heads to appoint that officer, and Senate confirmation is not required. DeJoy was appointed by the Board of Governors, not the president and the Senate has no say in his appointment. That would be perfectly fine if DeJoy were an inferior officer. But is he? The Constitution does not define superior or inferior officers, but the Supreme Court has provided guidance in case law like the Edmonds v. United States that we already reviewed. But the Supreme Court has provided guidance in case law like the Edmonds v. United States that we reviewed earlier. And if we come back to the case from June, the United States v. Arthrex was a case about drawing the line between superior and inferior officers, a distinction created by the Constitution's Appointment Clause. The key Supreme Court precedent on that dividing line is Edmund v. United States, which I mentioned we covered earlier, but it held that an officer is inferior only if directed and supervised by a superior appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate, which the Postmaster General is not. But if there is any federal official who is subordinate to a department head who should be considered a superior officer, it is the Postmaster General. In addition to having vast powers and responsibilities, the Postmaster General is unique in being simultaneously subordinate and equal to the other members of the Board of Governors. Recall that the Postmaster General is not only the head of the USPS, but a voting member of the Board of Governors. This position is in every way the equal of a board member, except that the others can be fired by the President for cause but the Postmaster General can only be removed by the board. The Postmaster General's status as a board member may be the clincher for superior officer designation. Every member of a multi-member body heading an agency must also be a principal officer because of their equal powers. They each have unilateral authority to tip a decision one way or another. Because the Postmaster General could and should be deemed a superior officer, the only person who has the power to appoint him is the President. The statute authorizing the Board of Governors to appoint a Postmaster General then violates the Appointment Clause. The Postmaster General is unconstitutional. Therefore, 
Every rule, every decision made by the Postmaster General is also unconstitutional. Now tell me, what do you think? Could this be the direction Workhorse is going in? And as always, if you've watched till the end, you my friend are totally awesome. Thank you so very much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.